Hey guys, I'm Siobhan, a fifth year medical resident. And today I'm gonna to be spending the day shadowing a social worker in a busy emergency department. Hey, good morning. This is Michelle. She's an emergency department social worker with a special interest in mental health and suicide prevention. Okay, so I'm thrilled to be here with you yeah, today and out. to see a different part of the emergency department is so mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. So what do we start with? What do we do first? So usually I start my day and I round with um, two nurses. One is a clinical nurse specialist and the other one is a nurse practitioner. We kind of go around to each nurse in each department, check in with them about their patients, see if they need any support, any discharging happening. The goal of rounds is to help patients get home safely with the supports they need and to prevent any unnecessary admissions to hospital. So I have this male patient that usually frequently comes to this place mm -hmm. and I know that in the past you've been providing support for this patient yeah. so that's why I called you. He's here today and I'll be, I will, I'll be grateful if you can see to him and give him the support that he needs. Absolutely, I will go check in with him very soon. I'll just go review his chart, okay? Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. So I know him quite well. He has a history of homelessness, mental health and substance use. So usually what I do is I meet him where he's at see if there's any supports I can provide him. If he wants me to call shelters, if he wants me to help him with getting him some clothes or some hygiene products, that's where I kind of start. That sounds perfect. Go. Okay. In America, over half a million people experience homelessness. Shelters help many people. And yet, there's still over 230,000 Americans that are living in places that weren't designed for humans to live in. And this is a ripple effect. It leads to trouble accessing healthcare, proper nutrition, and social connections. Here in Canada, we're also struggling to do better, with 20 to 30,000 people homeless on any given night. All right, so the next step for me is to call shelters. The patient gave me verbal consent, so I'm going to call the shelters, check in, see if they have any space, and if he's able to stay there. Just calling to check in on bed availability, wondering if you have anything. So far, Michelle has called two shelters, and they're both full. Now there's just one left to call. No, I, I'm sorry. I'm just asking you to look into this patient and if they are restricted, because they're sharing to me that they're restricted, and I'm just not sure if that's true, false, or what kind of that looks like. All right, so unfortunately, he can't return to the shelter due to being restricted. He's restricted until the end of the year. It's very likely this is related to any physical or verbal aggression. I know the shelters worked really hard with him to best support him, but unfortunately, they have to set their boundaries as well. What, what do we do? Um, so I will next go talk to him and update him, um, and then I'll try and problem solve with him. Um, I know that he doesn't have any family that he's comfortable with or close with, and he doesn't stay with friends. So unfortunately, the next option is for him to return to the streets. But like, I mean, the winter is coming. I mean, we've got in the next couple months, it's mm -hmm. probably gonna be snow. Like, what options are there? So usually when the weather gets very cold, the shelters then will um, make exceptions. They'll allow more people. Um, I'm not sure how that's gonna work with COVID. Wow. Yeah, okay. it's unfortunate. That's gonna be tough for him to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we're picking out some warm clothes that have been donated to the hospital and some food for him to eat here, plus an extra bag to take with him. And finally, we're going to meet the pharmacist here in the emergency department to get a naloxone kit for the patient. Here you go, we can go over that with them later. Sure, thanks. Great. Naloxone, also known as Narcan, is a medication that quickly reverses an opioid overdose. When someone overdoses on drugs like fentanyl or heroin, their breathing slows down and eventually stops. So all you have to do to save their life is spray naloxone into their nose and then bring them to the hospital. But if they still aren't responding, you should be calling for help and starting chest compressions. And actually, in Canada, anyone at risk can get a free naloxone kit from the pharmacy, just like our patient. So now we've got to break the bad news that there aren't any available shelters. We've got food, clothing, and supplies to help him, but it still feels really terrible to tell someone that they've got to keep living on the street. So after Michelle gave the food, the clothing to the patient, um, when he found out that he wasn't going to be able to stay or get admitted to the hospital and that there weren't any shelters for him, he became pretty verbally aggressive and mm -hmm. I was really glad that security was standing there. I, I actually took a step back, mm -hmm. uh, even though Michelle didn't. Um, and I just, I can't help but feel you put so much effort into this and then to get that response back, that's got to be so hard emotionally. Like, how do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, yeah. 
So I feel it can be tricky because we're working with individuals that maybe aren't ready to take certain steps in life. So I have to meet them where they're at and utilize the tools and the means that I have to best help them. Tough, tough yeah. for you, yeah. These are big issues that can't be solved by a single person. And that's why Michelle has this meeting with healthcare providers and administrators from around the city to try and advocate for this patient. And we're encouraging him to leave, saying we've done all the tests we can, we've done everything, I'm giving him food, clothing, we're giving him wound care. And usually we have to call security, has been our experience most of the times. So I think we're just at a point where we just need to come up with kind of a flow to best help him. And even at the end of this meeting, there's no perfect solution. Just imagine not having a cell phone or a permanent address. How do you arrange follow-up appointments or attend a virtual appointment during the pandemic? These are the kind of challenging situations that social workers deal with every day. So Michelle has this on her desk, which I think sums up pretty much the social work role. They just make things happen. You know, whether that's connecting with resources, advocating for patients, or things that you wouldn't expect. Like Michelle basically runs a lost and found here. She's got this huge binder of things that patients say they've lost, things that they've found in the hospital. That could be health cards, hearing aids, jewelry of patients. And why is social worker doing this? I don't know, because they just make things happen. And that's definitely the name of the game today. Now at 4 p.m., Michelle hands over to Suzanne, who takes over for the evening shift. Suzanne is also a social worker, and she splits her time between the emergency department and the palliative care team, where she gets to care for patients over a longer period of time. Now, Suzanne starts by checking the emergency department tracker to see if there are any patients that might need her help. And I wish you guys could see this, but it's basically a tracker is our electronic system to show all the different patient names, what their chief complaint is, and sort of how long they've been here. It's sort of like a, yeah, it tracks patients in the emergency department. Yeah, common things that I would look for are things like any anxiety, depression, mental health concerns, situational concerns, or if they're very young in here in the eMERGE, then I will also take a look and see if they might benefit from social work. I used to do this when I was on night float, when I'd be on call, but it was slightly different. It was more just like mentally preparing for myself for how many patients were coming my way. Yeah. <laughs> We've heard about a patient who has been newly diagnosed with advanced cancer. So we're going to see how we can support the patient and his family. Yeah, IC9, okay. um, newly diagnosed with cancer, okay. um, has just been made palliative. Do you know if any family is over there right now? Hawk is calling in two family members to come. And we're okay getting rid of the patient? 100%. So it sounds like for this patient, um, he's his main goal is to be comfortable. Um, he is choosing a palliative approach to care. So we're gonna just make sure we manage his symptoms. We're not gonna be poking or prodding anymore at him. I mean, I could already see just in there how reassured the family was mm -hmm. having your presence there. Oh, thank you. Know? you. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I don't want to make their day worse. So whatever we can do to like make it not worse. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can't make it better, but. Um... Code blue, level five, room 537. I didn't expect us to actually be going to Code Blues, to be honest, but I, I realized that we don't have to run quite as fast as I do when I'm <laughs> covering the Code Blue pager. The patient was found unresponsive by her nurse with a weak pulse. The Code Blue was called, and by the time we arrived, the team was already doing CPR and preparing to intubate the patient. So it's certainly a, a different experience, uh, not being jumping in right away, it makes me want to do that, but uh, getting to see what's happening in the back end, getting uh, family aware, getting people involved, um, and, and supporting the team. The role of a social worker during a Code Blue involves calling the family to update them, supporting medical team members during or after the Code Blue, and supporting their families or other patients that might be in the room at the time. In this, this particular room, there are four patients in there, so that can be, I'm sure, quite traumatic uh, yeah. to have all of these, this going on right beside them. Yeah, like 15 or 20 people suddenly rushing in, there's tons of medical terms being shouted around, it's yeah. very chaotic. Everybody knows their role and has their place and sort of dances around each other, but for somebody who doesn't know what's happening, it can be pretty, be pretty scary. scary. Yeah. 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 And they did it! They restarted the patient's heart. 
and now she's being transferred to the intensive care unit. So we've got some work to do now that our patient's pulling down to the ICU. We're gonna go let the front and the eMERGE screener know that the family's on their way, just so that we smooth the way for them. With COVID especially, there's a lot of visiting rules. Uh, um, and we want to make sure that everybody's in the loop about who's coming in yeah. so that we don't inadvertently cause more stress. All right, 8 p.m. and that's a wrap. So I want to say a huge thank you to Suzanne and Michelle for this incredible experience. And of course, the whole emergency department for making this possible. So if you're interested in seeing more videos like this where I'm shadowing different allied health professionals, then check out this playlist because there's so many there. Anyway, I'll see you in the next video. So bye for now.